Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Radical Exchange monthly webinar. I'm Jake Taranti. I'm the editor in chief of the Chicago Hello, everyone, Policy Review, and, welcome to and I'm a soon to graduate master's of public policy student Taranti. at the I'm Chicago the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, so actually, I should probably say I'm the former editor in chief uh, because just yesterday I passed that title on to my successor in anticipation of my graduation in June. So that's very exciting for me. Uh, also exciting, uh, we have a great panel lined up for you today. A, uh, we have uh, an array of speakers who are going to talk to us about the role of democratization across the economy and across policymaking. Uh, we're in a situation today where governments are starting to rush to get coronavirus vaccines to the public, and that means we're in a time of change. Uh, democratization seems to be spreading in certain sectors of the economy. It's facilitated by a constant pressure that's being supplied by COVID towards full digital engagement. But then there are others in society who've reacted uh, with some amount of anger to what they uh, interpret as the government's imposition of various health policies. Uh, that's produced some amount of populist revolt. Uh, so we're left with this tension between democratization and populism, and these overlap sometimes, and uh, other times they conflict. Uh, in, in, in quadratic voting, I think uh, a lot of people see a uh, potential uh, for a third way out of that sort of uh, conflict. Uh, with quadratic voting and quadratic finance in general, uh, there's this promise of a revitalized collective decision-making process in a wide a variety of do domains across society and the economy. Um, and I think that there's an increasing number of examples uh, that support that new hope, uh, both in theory uh, and in research, but also uh, in practice, which is pretty exciting as well. Uh, today, we're joined by three experts, and they're all on the forefront of this work. Uh, and I'd like to welcome them today. Uh, professor uh, Charlotte Cavalle, uh, who is the ass assistant professor at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Her research examines the dynamics of popular attitudes towards redistributive social policies at a time of rising inequality, high fiscal stress, and high levels of, of immigration. Previously, she was an assistant professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and a fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. Uh, she holds a PhD in government and social policy from Harvard University. Uh, welcome, Professor Cavalier. Thank you. We're also joined by Sachin Mittal. Uh, his work at Gitcoin includes the Kernel Fellowship and the Downtown Stimulus Platform. Uh, the Downtown Stimulus Platform uh, allows communities to efficiently distribute investments in local businesses. Um, it distributed $25,000 from local philanthropies to businesses in downtown Bowler. It was an amazing pilot project that they worked on. Um, so thank you uh, for joining us, Sachin. Thanks, Jay. Absolutely. Uh, finally, uh, later in the panel, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Senator Chris Hansen. Uh, he represents Senate District 31 in the Colorado State Senate. Uh, he spearheaded the first experiments with quadratic voting in the Colorado State Senate, uh, specializes in energy sector economics and data analytics, over 20 years of experience in the global energy industry, and five years in the Colorado Gen General Assembly before the Senate. Uh, he currently serves on the Joint Budget Committee, as well as the Chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, and before his work as an effect elected official, he was senior director at IHS Market. Uh, he has he holds a PhD in economic geography from Oxford University. Uh, so we're looking forward to the Senator joining us a little bit later um, in this panel. Um, as a reminder, uh, we are taking questions on the Slido app. Uh, please use the code RxC to access, access the Q&A room. Uh, but with that uh, preface all out of the way, um, the first thing I, I kind of want to make sure that we do here uh, to make sure that we're being concrete. Let's define our terms a little bit. Uh, Charlotte, uh, quadratic voting, sometimes called QV for short, um, what is that? <laughs> so I'm pretty sure everyone in the room knows, but just briefly to make sure we're on the same page, you can think of quadratic voting as a tool, a methodology to try to understand not only what people want, but how much they want it, because life is always about compromise. And a compromise is about compromising on stuff you don't care that much about, and potentially get it what you want on the stuff you really care about. And so QV is trying to help us do that. So how does it do that? You're given a budget and you're allowed to vote either at a given time or across time on different issues. With this fixed budget, you start voting once, twice, three, four times. But the idea is that the pricing of these votes is quadratic. So the more you signal your interest in a specific issue, the more costly it is. Okay, and so we can discuss the, the theory behind it, but what it does 
it forces, um, it creates differences, it gives us more information on not only who favors a specific proposal in the case of policies, I can see the senator just joined us, welcome, <laughs> but also how many people care a lot about that specific policy versus others that people might agree with, but are that what we call low intensity. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, Senator, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, great to see everybody. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, so I know I know you have a limited schedule today. I, I want to make sure that we do talk about what's going on in Colorado, which is really exciting. It's crazy. So for, could you talk us through this a little bit? First of all, like what was the, the problem you guys wanted to solve here? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy to, to join everybody today to talk about how we applied QV uh, to the appropriations process in Colorado. And this is our second time uh, using this methodology. I, I was uh, chair of House Appropriations in 2019, um, and I'll spare you the story, but I'm now in the Senate and uh, am chair of Senate Appropriations. And I really felt like this was a, a great time for us to bring back the methodology and a, a huge thank you to Radical Exchange for, for helping make that possible logistically. Um, the problem we were trying to solve, and it's, it's a common one at legislative bodies all over the world, is you've got a limited pot of money. In this case, in, in this particular budget year, Colorado has $50 million to spend on legislative proposals. So that was our, our budget set aside. That was the max we could spend on all the bills that were coming through the legislature uh, as far as new spending, new programs. And we had dozens and dozens of proposals to spend that money. In fact, if you look at everything that was coming through the system, it was about 70 bills uh, that would have allocated uh, you know, about $85 million. So how do we go from our starting list down to what we're gonna actually fund? And that's where I think QV really shines. Uh, and I heard Charlotte just a minute ago talking about intensity. That is exactly what we were missing with our old methodology, because what we used to do is we just send out a list to everybody and say, hey, you know, put the tick marks, you get five tick marks next to the things you like. Um, and so you don't really get that depth and breadth information that you get when you use uh, QV. Um, and so this year, we did a combined uh, survey with all the House and Senate Democrats. Um, I also offered this up to the Republicans. Uh, you know, that's their own decision of how they want to, to do their own survey methodologies. But all the Democrats in the Colorado legislature, all 61 of them, uh, use the tool to input uh, their, you know, using their 100 credits uh, and allocating those across, uh, you know, these this long list of bills and spending ideas. And uh, it just, you know, really worked great for the problem that we were trying to address. Great. I wonder how did you explain it to your colleagues? Did they did they get it? How how did you go about that? <laughs> well, I, I would say I, I would say my uh, I would there were two levels of explanation. There was sort of the uh, hey, here you're going to receive this link, you're going to get to go to this website, and you're going to get to click on the bills that you like. And what I would say to people is, if you like the bill, click once. If you really like the bill, click twice. If you love the bill, click three times, et cetera, until you run out of clicks, essentially. Uh, and the, of course, the website was set up so that it did all of the uh, you know, subtraction of your credits as you dynamically put in your preferences. And so it was in that sense, it was really easy to understand. Just if you like a bill a lot, just keep clicking uh, and keep clicking on bills until you run out of credits. Um, there were many of my colleagues who were like, oh, well, how does this, you know, how is this being done? And for them, uh, I would you know, carefully step through the, the QV methodology, explain why it was better uh, than the alternatives. Um, and and you know, so like most things in life, you had some people who were really interested in the nitty gritty detail and you had some others that were less interested, um, but I just you know, provided that as people desired. Right, so, and now I'm wondering, so you, you've done this process now twice. What were the sort of budgeting outcomes that were indicated by this process different from what would have happened otherwise, do you think? Yeah, I, I would say just we get a much richer data set. I mean, that idea of depth and breadth uh, that you can capture with this methodology is so much better than the alternative. And so I think as, as we were looking at 
you know, which bills do we advance and which ones do we have to uh, hold on or, or uh, cut back? Um, you know, there's lots of factors that go into it. It's not just uh, this particular survey, but this survey serves as a foundational element for those discussions, because now we've got a good indication of, of what are the highest priorities for the caucus uh, as a whole. And then you add on to that all the other factors that come into legislative discussions. And, you know, it's all, always joked that it's sausage making. It's still sausage making. It's not like this is a, uh, you know, a magic bullet, so to speak, or a, a perfect quantitative solution to the whole problem. But it, it is foundational and it, and it sets us up for a much better set of conversations about all the other factors once we uh, build it on top of the survey results. So one thing I'm wondering is, okay, so, you know, you're obviously rep representing Colorado, um, such and I know that you had downtown stimulus also uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Is there something about Colorado that makes it particularly receptive, do you think, to these kinds of reforms? You know, I, I mean, Colorado is um, one of those states that I think, you know, is, is willing to try new things on a regular basis. I think our politics here lend itself to that, I think it's a, a can-do kind of spirit. I mean, you know, the Western uh, Western spirit of like we're just going to overcome any obstacle. I think is still very much, uh, you know, in the water here uh, from from pioneer days, and I and I think it still permeates our politics uh, and and colors, you know, the the things we can and can't do uh, at the legislature. And so, you know, I, I think there were certainly people who were hesitant about this, like why are we trying this new thing? Um, but I think most people are willing to try uh, and experiment a little bit, see if we can find a better way to, to build the mousetrap, so to speak. And, um, you know, most of my colleagues uh, just, you know, jumped in with, uh, with gusto. Right. And it's also, I think, that you in particular have a background that um, makes you more receptive to these kinds of ideas. I mean, because you have a PhD and economics. Um, how, how did you get involved in this process to begin with? Yeah, I well, it was actually a, a close friend of mine from grad school knows Glenn pretty well yeah. and introduced us, gosh, about two and a half years ago, I think it was. And he, he started sharing with me some of the ideas from his book and some of the work that you guys have been doing at Radical Exchange. And, and I described to him the problem the same way I just described it to you of, of this long list of things we'd like to spend money on, but only a limited pot of money. And he's like, hey, I think this is perfect. You've got, you know, 40, 50 members. You've got, you know, several dozen choices. Like, this is a great uh, fit for what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I did an engineering degree. I did nuclear engineering in undergrad. I did uh, engineering in graduate school and then eventually did economic geography as a, at the PhD level. And so I've done a lot of experimental economic type of uh, things throughout my academic career and, and when I was in uh, consulting. And I just thought, hey, let's let's give this a try. Um, you know, we've got with support from Radical Exchange, right? You had it helped us get the interface set up, made things very easy. Um, and you know, I, I I hope there'll be lots of other people who who uh, pick this up because it worked really really well in Colorado. It's awesome to hear. And so, can you talk to me a little bit about um, the, that pro that nitty gritty process of like how you got this going because was, was it just something where you were like oh okay I'm going to dictatorially say that this is how we're going to do this procedure or, or did it have to go through an approval process how's that work yeah I mean it's it's very much you know consensus building in the legislative body and so when, when I was in uh, House Appropriations Chair in 2019 I basically pitched this to my colleagues and said hey you're, you're willing to give this a try we had you know a very similar tough set of choices to make in 2019 and, uh, you know, people are like, yeah, let's give it a shot. And so, um, and then when I came back as, as Senate Appropriations Chair, I made the same pitch uh, to the new set of leaders in the, in the uh, both the House and the Senate and my colleagues. And, uh, you know, everyone said, yeah, let's give it, give it a try. So I, I think uh, it, it was very much just kind of a, a proposal that I explained to everyone of, of why, you know, it was is advantageous for us to use it. And, uh, you know, folks were willing to give me the benefit of the doubt, even if they were maybe a little hesitant. And, uh, and you know, I think the result uh, came, out, came out really great. Charlotte, I want to bring you in here. Yeah, do you mind? I'm actually really curious on how it works. And for people listening, so you'll get this, this data set where you have all the members of your caucus on several issues with 
whatever vote they put, however they spent their credit. And then yeah. there's still a kind of philosophical decision on how you aggregate this, right? And we're in a majoritarian system, we tend to think we'll pick whatever the majority wants. One way to go about with QV is to say, we'll pick whatever issue got the most votes, which might or might bring in a majority, right? And so I was kind of curious, how did you guys actually use that data set and interpret it? My second question is, I think theoretically that quadratic voting does well, it's kind of break the a priori coalitions and deal making that happens in the background where some members will kind of coordinate to send the same signal because maybe down the road they'll get some help on something else. Do you feel that QV, if there are these types of coalitional politics within the caucus, that QV clarified things or kind of brought? Oh, Charlotte, yeah, that's such a great, great point. I mean, uh, you know, I kind of was joking about the sausage making. Absolutely, there are coalition politics going on. Um, you know, we think about uh, like all the different sub caucuses within the Democrats or or on the Republican side, either either side. Um, there are centrist sort of moderate caucuses that form, right? All these different con reconfigurations and, and different uh, interest groups that align. Um, and one of the things I loved about the QV method is that it is a link that is personalized and it's it's a secret ballot, essentially. Now, it's not to say you might, uh, you know, might talk to your legislative allies and say, hey, I really like this bill and I hope, you know, you'll support it too. I mean, of course that's happening, um, but it is, you know, you're filling this thing out in your pajamas, at, uh, you know, at, at, in the comfort of your own home, um, you're, you know, sitting by yourself. And so, you know, we get, I think, a better indication of people's actual preferences and uh, the depth of the, of those preferences. And that's, that's why I think the methodology works so well. Great. Um, and uh, we have a question from the audience um, from Matt. Uh, are there any other kinds of problems in state government where you think QV might be useful? Yeah, I, Matt, it's something I've, I've thought a lot about of kind of where are there other places we could roll this out? I mean, I would say the type of problem that I'm presenting here with the appropriations process is something we we face on a constant basis. I mean, we are now, you know, looking at how do we allocate federal stimulus money? We are looking at how do we uh, appropriate uh, limited state stimulus money? Uh, how do we think about, uh, you know, filling in the gaps between those two packages? And again, we've got a, a big set of options and a limited set of resources. And so I think, I think those types of problems come up constantly at the legislature. Um, and, you know, I, I also serve on the Joint Budget Committee, which is in Colorado, a little bit unique. We have three senators and three House members who get together, and we meet for about six months to write the budget here. And we come up against you know these types of problems all the time. And so, yeah, I'll be looking for other opportunities to use it. Um, but I, I would say we started with kind of the proverbial low-hanging fruit here, because this is an annual, steady state kind of issue that we're going to face every single session in the legislature. I'm interested in uh, direct democracy. I wonder, could you talk about if this could be used for constituents? And have you talked to constituents about this? Have they had a reaction? Has, has, have any of them said, can we use this? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think about, uh, you know, the sort of party organizations in Denver. Uh, you know, in my case, I'm a Democrat. I'm affiliated with the Democratic Party of Denver, of course. Um, you know, are there other ways we could use QV for, for party decision making? Um, and as you say, are there other places for direct democracy uh, to, to take advantage of this? I, I don't know the answer uh, on that. I will say that, uh, you know, the, the larger the pool, obviously the logistics get more difficult. Um, you know, you think about this as like a public voting method on something. Um, I can see some significant logistical hurdles. Uh, because we were talking about 61 people in the Colorado legislature, you know, it's pretty easy to set up a link and have that be secure and all that sort of thing. Um, obviously more difficult when you try to expand that to hundreds, thousands. Uh, you know, in Denver's case, it would be 800,000 people. In Colorado's case, it would be 6 million people. Uh, you know, it just gets way tougher. So those sorts of scaling challenges we're, we're going to have to think about, uh, you know, how to overcome those even after we identify appropriate problem sets. Right, because in, in Colorado, you do have some form of direct dem democracy, maybe for ballot initiatives. Am I correct about that? We do. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a process where uh, groups can petition to put things on the ballot. Um, it's how marijuana was, uh, you know, legalized in Colorado was through a ballot petition. 
Um, we had decriminalization of mushrooms in Denver last year through a ballot petition. Um, so yeah, that, that direct democracy is certainly part of our tradition here. We have someone in the, in the comments who's saying that they are starting a Boulder-based nonprofit um, that has QV in their bylaws. So apparently this thing is leaving the lab big time. All right, fantastic. I wonder, could you, could you maybe reflect um, on the future of QV in Colorado, just even in the legislature, but even more broadly than that in government? Yeah, I mean, Jake, I think, I, you know, I, I have the chance to, I think, continue to do the process I described to you this morning. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be appropriations chair in the Senate next year. And, um, you know, after that, uh, you know, we'll, we, we refresh everything every two years at the legislature as far as different leadership positions. Um, but I, I think my hope is to, you know, successfully use it this year. I think that's been the case try to repeat that success next year and just make this a regular part of how we do business in the legislature. And then as we identify, you know, other problems where it's a good fit, be able to roll it out, but be able to roll it out based on the confidence that has been built from this initial, you know, uh, success. And, and so I don't know that I've got a, a great list of, you know, where do we go next right now? I'm just trying to make sure we do this process in a really uh, solid way and that everybody feels like it's working well. And then as, as we do that for a couple of cycles, we'll have the foundation to, to look at other problems. Great. Oh, and we're, we're getting another question about um, the logistics of this. Um, the question is, how did the mechanism of submitting options work um, in, in the case uh, in Colorado? And I, this is something I've wondered about too. I think that this process of setting the agenda is actually critical to the outcome. It's, it is the uh, outcome in some ways. For sure, yeah, for sure. And, and, and that is a relatively easy question to answer because each legislator is allowed to introduce five bills of their own choosing. Um, we can then get extra bills if we get approval of leadership. Those are called late bills uh, in, in Colorado parlance. But everybody gets to submit their best ideas at the beginning of the session. And that essentially becomes the decision set. So that, that is determined by the elected representatives in the House and the Senate of what gets put on the agenda and what doesn't. Um, of course, each representative and senator is hearing from constituents, is hearing from stakeholder groups, uh, special interest groups, industry groups, all coming together to say, hey, we need a bill on X, Y, and Z. That's the normal legislative process. Those then become you know, the decision set that we look at as we get into March and April. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the pretty transparent methodology as far as what gets introduced. Right. Tell us about, there's a question coming from online about the secret ballot nature of this. Um, so how important is that um, to the process as it's done in Colorado? Um, and there's the sort of point that, you know, the admin of whoever is, you know, administrating the link should know who voted for what. I don't know if that's actually the case, but that seems to be the implication of the question. Can you talk about yeah, the secrecy we of the ballot? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I mean, we, we carefully manage, uh, manage that. Of course, there's always, uh, you know, uh, data integrity issues that you're managing with any uh, survey process, yeah. uh, as, as I'm sure most people on the line are familiar with. Um, so, but I, I mean, I, I feel good about, you know, the, the, the process that we built and, and working with Radical Exchange to make sure we had you know, the right data in the right hands at the right time. And, uh, you know, the, the survey went out, we got individual votes back. Uh, individuals couldn't see what everybody else was voting on, only their, the, only their inputs. And I, I have to be careful when I say voting, I should say spending their credits, because it's right. not a vote, right? I mean, it's a very important distinction. Any vote I take is, you know, on the floor or in committee and is a matter of public record. This is a survey, a very important difference uh, uh, between the two. But the survey data, you know, was not uh, cross-pollinated, so people couldn't see what other people were putting in for their survey. Uh, and then we got aggregate data back out. Like, I don't know who voted, or sorry, who used their credits uh, on what, what things. So that, that was an important piece of the process um, that, you know, just everybody could do their own inputs. And then we got the aggregate data for the House and aggregate data for the Senate, and that was the level of visibility for everyone. Yeah, Char Charlotte, I I'd like to bring you in here. Um, what's your reaction to, you know, we've, we've now heard 
quite a bit of detail about what happened in Colorado. What, what's your reaction as a, you know, an academic? Yeah, also I wanted to clarify, I saw some questions online. So yes, the idea of quadratic voting, it's in a setting where there are some resource constraints. It can, so in politics, it's usually time or money. And so there needs to be compromise. Not everything can be done. If there were abundance, we could, do, we could just do everything. So just clarifying some of the tasks. So um, yeah. your question, so my reaction to what's happening in Colorado, I'm, part of me is a little um, intrigued about how you use the data ultimately. <laughs> So if you could actually add something on that. The, my other thought is um, I've been looking at this in large samples, 4,000 respondents. And there's two differences with the setting, like the one that Senator Hansen used it in, which is that in a Senate context, it's, it's strategic. It's a small end, the stakes are high. So all actors are very engaged. When you move to a large setting, it's just less strategic. People don't know if what they say on the survey is going to have any implications, right? And so theoretically, that means that QV will perform particularly well, I think, in the context that the senator is using it. In large and survey research, it's a bit more complicated. Right now, we're finding that there might be some cognitive barrier. It's performing much better with people who have a college education than respondents who don't, for instance. So something to think about this, I don't think it's a problem in a kind of small N, meaning a small group setting, or I don't know how many senators there were in your case in the caucus, but um, yeah. so yeah, so that's kind of my thought. It's, yeah. it's kind of yeah. a function and it, of the context. Yeah, super important point. I mean, they, uh, there are 20 Democrats in the Colorado Senate, 20 out of 35. Uh, and in the House, we have 41 out of 65. So for a total of 61, Democrats in the General Assembly or in the state legislature. So yeah, small in, highly engaged, high stakes. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the context matters a lot. Um, but that's why, I, you know, as I learned about the option from Glenn and, and Radical Exchange, I was like, oh, this, this feels like a perfect fit, uh, you know, quantitatively for what we're trying to do. Um, I apologize. I'm going to have to run back to the floor. We are still voting uh, here this morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to join all of you. A big thank you. Uh, for your help and in, in the logistics. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to, to seeing you all again next time. Senator Hansen, thank you for joining us so much. Yep. You have a great day. Bye now. Um, so, uh, Sachin, I, I want to bring you in on, on uh, some of what Charlotte was just saying there. I, can you talk about the um, downtown stimulus uh, program? First of all, what, what was that? And then maybe you can talk to some of the points that she raised about um, working with maybe a larger group of people. I'm not sure how many were involved in that, but maybe you could go into detail on that. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, maybe I can start with QF first because oh, that yeah, is the, good idea. Yeah, that is the important piece of the puzzle here. So QF is basically maths. I wouldn't like uh, you know uh, throw jargon at you guys, but whatever Charlotte explained on QV is it's basically when you're spending instead of spending your credits or like your votes, you're actually putting in money where your mouth is. And that money is basically being distributed. Uh, like, it's like, uh, you can think of QF, it's it's a formula for distributing a matching pool to a set of objects, right? Like a matching pool is raised for QF and then a crowdfunding campaign is started where it's matched according to QF algorithm. Like, uh, so uh, when, Charlotte explained QF, if you uh, just replace spending of voting or credits with money, then it becomes a crowdfunding campaign, right? And then just imagine that crowdfunding campaign also has a matching pool on its head. And that crowdfunding campaign is basically determining how that matching pool money is gonna be distributed amongst these set of options. And so QF, uh, the first, like first implementation was of course Gitcoin grants, but I'll come to that later. The second implementation, which is more relevant to the audience here, is downtown stimulus, which Jake mentioned. And downtown stimulus is basically uh, two. The objects which I'm talking about here are the downtown businesses in Boulder, Colorado. This this started as a pilot project because uh, during the COVID wave one in uh, Colorado and a lot of like businesses were suffering uh, damages post uh, COVID. They were not active anymore. And then, you know, it's just a problem which everyone can relate to. 
And to solve that, uh, Kevin Awoki, who is founder of Gitcoin, collaborated with people in uh, the government. And then he created this platform, DTS, along with us. Like we were, uh, like I was, you know, uh, lucky enough to collaborate on this project. And then we basically created a platform uh, engine which can actually implement QF and help uh, pro like the down, uh, Boulder downtown businesses by where the locals in the Colorado uh, can actually donate to those projects. And then there was a matching pool of 25 grants from the philanthropists and Boulder. Uh, and that was matched and distributed to the uh, downtown businesses in Colorado. Yeah, so the way it kind of worked as I understand it was, yeah, the philanthropists had that pool of 25K and then they had all these people in the local community who said, hey, I want, I don't know, a coffee shop, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, a shop, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you had all these people who were like, okay, I'm going to donate to this. And the more that they donated, the more individual people donated, the more matching funds they would get. Um, how, how many exactly. people participate, do you know? There were 16.1k contributions from total in total, and uh, wait, uh, 16,000 contributions, yeah. Wait, okay. so the total the total money that was accrued was 41k thousand dollars, and that was distributed among six businesses. And one example, if I might give, is one of one of the businesses got for around four grants and donations from the people, and then that was matched with the pool and then it accrued extra 3.7k in funding and then that business uh, got a total funding of approximately 8k in donations and this all happened in like 15 days so it was a big success where people were actually donating to this cause and we were able to facilitate this through the platform yeah can i just clarify um because this, these were people who were donating real money, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, so just to make sure we're clear on, because what we were talking in the context of survey measurement, we're all given the same amount of credit. So we're equal when we start, because we have the same amount of credit. In this context, by definition, we're not equal. Some people are rich, some people are poor. So the idea is to actually use the quadratic function to kind of give more weight to the donations of low-income people, people who can't donate that much to kind of balance things out. Just, just wanted to clarify because we do start with the same number of credit. We're equal in that sense in the survey context. Yeah, and in context of QF where like if you're putting in like $100 uh, to a business against you're putting like $1 to a business, that also matters. So let's say 10 voters, 10 donors are donating, so here, voters are basically replaced by donors, right? So 10 donors are like donating one $1 to one business. So they are like $1, 10 donations on one business. Against that, there's a one donation of $100, right? So the matching here will be totally different. Like in case of $100 donation, there be, might be a matching of $10. That depends on QF, but approximately saying that will be $10. And in case of those 10 donations, where one dollar donation each, there will be a donation of more than hundred dollars. So the weight is actually, yeah. To explain this better, you guys can just visit like WTFS QF website. Uh, I I don't have access to the chat, so I'll just drop it in the Slido, where you can just play with it and actually understand how QF works. And there's been talk of using this in the context of funding newspapers also, where you could have newspapers supported by a lot of people who donate a little bit, and then public funds would be used to kind of buttress the group of people who can't donate that much but want to see this newspaper exist, versus the current model where a newspaper can be bought by just one very rich person. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, that what you're talking about is almost like a quadratic version of Substack. Is that is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, when you bring a newspaper, that that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, like QF, like it just doesn't have this. Like this is very one very particular use case, but there are a lot of implementations like in crypto world where where I belong. 
you know <laughs> and just like there there's this whole set of things that you can do uh you can just call it like a quadratic land right you can use democratized voting and you know just voting on things via qf qv and then when it comes to funding you can use qf they uh one, one example is of course downtown stimulus what uh senator senator hansen mentioned that is another example of qv and then there are examples like gitcoin grants who are facilitating like more than million dollars in public good funding to a lot of uh, public good projects and the blockchain ecosystem and then uh, you can simply implement it on a grant system where you need voting from a lot of people and you need uh, decision making from a lot of people right and just uh, instead of favoring projects or favoring objects in terms of donation you can actually let uh, voting of people weigh in I want to re return a little bit to this question of inequality that Charlotte brought up earlier. Um, what, what are your concerns around um, inequality um, in um, quadratic fu funding and quadratic voting potentially? Oh, Charlotte. Sorry, I thought, <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, it's, it's so, so of course quadratic voting, so let's just separate. So because someone asked in the chat, um, QA is a survey, let's just agree that there's one person, one vote in many circumstances, which basically is a, a, a question about how do we implement equality? So one way to implement equality in my context is to make sure everyone has the same number of credits. So we all started the same way. And there you deviate from one person, one vote because you allow some people to vote more than once for an issue. But the idea is that it's fair because everyone gets the same opportunity and because people care about different things differently, the final output is actually better because people compromise on the stuff they don't care about, but get to signal that they want to see something they care about. In the context of funding, the inequality is, is there, right? And so quadratic voting there is trying to rebalance the playing field. So you see how for quadratic voting to function, whether in the finance uh, setting or in the preference measurement setting, you need um, some form of strong institutions, in, for instance, to make sure that credits are not being traded in the survey context by rich people who can buy them and say, give me your vote so I can use them. Okay, so there are these types of institutions. In the financing context, you need an institution that's a public good that is willing to match the donations, right? So everyone needs to agree on how we're going to raise the funds for this matching pool resource, for instance. So quadratic voting cannot exist on its own. It needs to go with a set of, of institutions that enable to keep it the, um, the playing field leveled. Uh, Sachin, what's your response to that? It sounds like there were some you know, concerns raised with uh, QF. No, yeah, I agree, uh, definitely. So when we bring in the concept of matching pools, right? So you need institutions, you need uh, people who are willing to support uh, a particular cause, right? In case of, a case of Gitcoin grants, uh, a lot of organizations in blockchain, they are donating like $100,000 just so they can pool in money and actually support the public good funding, right? And uh, like, I don't know how it makes sense on a large scale for like the web two world or uh, if we remove the crypto part of it, but you know, the organizations are willing to donate like hundred grants to, uh, uh, to support projects without any direct incentive, just, just other than signaling of their name. It just shows that like the token economics and the crypto economics is allowing these projects to pool in like hundred grants to just support uh, with, without their direct uh, benefit. So um, I guess like for to answer Charlotte's question, I think this is being enabled. Uh, this um, this cause, which is basically progressing, like so, Gitcoin grants is gonna like we are gonna launch round ten soon, and we have grown significantly round to round and that shows the success of it and actually a lot of projects are being held like 
uh, a lot of educators, community developers are getting funded by it. And uh, to answer concern, like uh, we keep getting more funding from the institutions and we keep get distributing more money to the projects and our audience who are seeking fundraising, right? And uh, that is possible because the incentives are still balanced due to crypto economics, where token, like uh, the organizations are able to raise money using tokens, right? And that's why they're able to like donate big amounts like 100 grand and they are able to distribute that money in terms of tokens and that actually is being used as real money for project development but, the, but take, just to answer your question the the two main threats to this setting right is in my context it's the ability to resell your credits on a black market so let's say you know in a in a in a kind of pure qv world we would all be born with a certain amount of credit that we'd then spend the rest of our lives voting on, deciding, you know, I'm not going to vote on this topic. I don't really care about it. But next yeah. year, I really care about, you know. But if there's a black market to resell that, that's the problem. In the context of QF, the issue is if a rich person can, in the background, organize all the small donors and buy them out with real money <laughs> to make sure they donate this $1 jointly as a large group, yeah. And then this person gets what they want and they get this additional. Um, so there are, there are ways to gain the system in that sense. There definitely are. And sorry, just, I, I'll just take one, one moment here. Like there definitely are ways to game the, the system. Like a project can basically uh, ask a lot of donors in their community and they can just send them money and then ask those donors to like put money back in a project, right? And that way they get the same amount of money back, but they also get the matching from the matching pool. But uh, to, uh, to resist this, we are introducing civil resistance and we are working very hard on basically uh, DIDs, which are like decentralized identities. And uh, we are using different protocols to create a trust score for every individual who is participant, uh, participating in the uh, funding. And that trust score is basically helping us understand if uh, someone is gaming the, gaming the system. And that way we are able to shut that particular uh, fund down or avoid that bad actor in the case of QF. But I also wanna, um, you know, I'm a UChicago public policy student, so I have to play sort of an economics 101 show. Um, now, Charlotte, this point that you raise about buying and selling votes, uh, one way to look at it is, oh, you know, buying and selling votes, that's illegal and wrong, uh, morally wrong. Uh, but the other way to look at it is, well, if someone pays me for my vote credits, that means that they want, they value them more than I do, right? Their willingness to pay is more than mine. So I sell it to them. Um, and then I get, yeah, yeah, I lose my political voice, but I get money and I like money. Um, what's the problem with that? Well, there's enough of a problem that we don't allow it in our current democracy where it's just one person, one person. So let's kind of compare what's happening with, again, QV in a context where our goal is to better measure what people want and how much they want it. So in this context right now, all we have is everyone has to show up at the same event and vote once. And so what QV is doing is saying, you're asked to think about multiple issues or multiple events and you're given this budget constraint okay so it's not a it's not the same and so um your question is what's the issue of selling it well you could sell your vote in the current context right but normatively we don't want to so your question applies to the current context and doesn't hold we have norms that say that this is bad and i'm happy to go and play the devil's advocate from the philosophical point of view but let's just assume we're keeping the same norm. So this should not also happen you know, in a QV context. The real issue, of course, and that's, um, it's, you know, so you're not selling your votes, you're selling your credits, you're selling your right to buy multiple votes on an issue. And so there's this issue of this other numeral call, call money that you're using to buy these credits. You might value it more because there's something else that you value out there, like being able to buy a car or feed your children or that kind of stuff. 
And so that's when, and that's where Michael Sandel has written books on that, is when the monetary part, the market part kind of permeates into the decision-making part. And for the moment, democratic societies, liberal societies are trying to build a wall between the two. Um, so, you know, my kind of prior is that we're still maintaining that normative wall. If you can make your case that it shouldn't be brought down, you know, you're entering a big philosophical debate here. And actually Glenn would be way more qualified to answer this question because he had to deal with it a lot. <laughs> well, I, I think that there's also a divide uh, potentially between uh, QF and QV uh, because they are both trying to solve the same problem. Right? They're both trying to solve this problem of, okay, we have these public goods, but we don't have enough of them. How do we move closer to the socially desirable welfare point? Uh, but they're coming at it from different directions, right? QV um, of the kind that Senator Hansen was talking about is let's come at it from the direction of government policy. Let's try to move government policy closer to the social optimum. But then QF is coming from like the other direction. It's saying, okay, let's see how we can change capital itself so that the capital is employed towards ends that create more socially desirable goods. Um, are, are they in, incompatible? Are they trying to solve the same problem and therefore are they at odds? Yeah, a session if you want to answer. It's uh, to some extent, it's, um, oh gosh, again, that's like the whole philosophy. But so again, the, the way I think about quadratic voting for survey research, let's be honest, QV, I think of QVSR in the context of measuring what people want and how much they want it. There's only one simple problem where we know QV does a good job is information, signaling, the ability to collect information about the world that has enough variance that we can use it for research in my context, for, for political decision making in um, the case of the senator, or in the bylaws of the Colorado Boulder organization, right, for decision making in this, in this small group. We just want better information, okay? In the QF setting, <laughs> you're trying, and I'll let Sashin uh, jump in here, you're trying to make sure that people who are already rich are not shaping the debate on what type of public goods should be uh, funded, both through personal donations, but also through the common pool of money that is coming, either through donations or you could imagine in the future through taxes. So in that sense, um, and we know QF is good for that, and we know QV is good for that. So that's what we know. You're asking a broader question, but I'll let you uh, jump in while it's fashion. Jump in. Yeah, definitely a broader question, guys. Like I, uh, my exposure to QF and QV is basically from Glenn's article, Vitalik's article, and um, my working on downtown stimulus and what like it's just my imagination maybe or just like exposure to what i know and uh, it's just like uh qf like qv is definitely something which is uh which has a much broader application and uh as you said like information signaling is the uh, uh important part like where like like when i was reading uh jake's article on direct democracy i i really liked what he mentioned about qf like QV, sorry, and how you can actually just give uh, voters the direct involvement uh, in uh, basically creating decisions, right? But QF on the whole, it's just like, uh, it, it, it has particular use cases, right? It has use cases, like I, I won't agree to the rich people term here because uh, <laughs> Like you can just uh, donate like one rupee or one dollar, which like one cent, and still make a make a huge impact, right? And uh, that and like it just uh, uh, depends on the different settings. Like one, of course, it was downtown stimulus, right? Like people just donated one dollar, and they were actually able to support like a candy shop, which they have been you know eating candy since like <laughs> their childhood. Right. And uh, uh, no, yeah, like as I said, guys, like I, I can, like as Charlotte said, it's like a really broad question when we talk about QF versus QV. But I guess uh, what I'd like to say is it's just uh, it's definitely applicable to different settings. 
And, and to be clear, what I, what I meant by uh, the rich right. is I said the status quo without QF is that people have the most money, get to have the most say on, oh, I really like this candy store. This one guy loves it, gets to donate a lot of money because he's rich enough. QF is trying to say, no, there's all these other folks who can't really help that person whose preferences are as, as important. Um, the Q, QVSR, QV, <laughs> is trying to solve another problem, which is, again, as I said, this absence of information. So let me give you the example of Brexit. So Brexit in the UK, it's a referendum where a bunch of people got to vote. And in the one person vote setting, the majority who showed up that day got to decide the future of Great Britain. QV is trying to say, there's another world out there where we would have had also measure preference intensity. And it's unclear whether or not, once we have this measure of preference intensity, there would at least be a democratic debate on is the majority who really wants Bre is there a majority who really wants Brexit, or is the majority who really want Brexit is smaller than the majority who really does not want Brexit, and so that's why I mean by additional variance. That's the problem that QV is very yeah. good at solving. Yeah, no, I agree to that. Charlotte, I, I want to. I'm having trouble defining the boundaries of where you think uh, QV, uh, and maybe to a lesser extent QF, but I think most of your work is in, around this QV idea. What are the boundaries of where that should be applicable, and where, you know, how how can we make sure that it's not going into places where it might cause chaos? I guess is my question. Yeah. So there's several ways to think about chaos. So I got interested in it uh, because research requires variance, and I was just not getting a lot of variance. So if I ask a bunch of Republicans or Democrats what they think about, you know, gay marriage, the wall, the border wall, abortion, they're all going to tell me opposite things, and they're all going to sound pretty intense about it, because it's so politicized. And so I wanted more variance, okay? So in this context, chaos is when using QV actually generates variance that is not informative, meaning for instance, someone who really deeply cares about all these things, if the budget constraint applies too much, they're going to randomly put most of their votes on one and have to kind of res res um, restrain from voting on an issue just because they don't have enough credit, not because they don't care about it. And so suddenly, the someone who's put two votes on abortion and three votes on the wall, for instance, I think it's a meaningful difference when it isn't. It's just they were... They cared about everything and the budget constraint was quote unquote too constraining. They didn't have enough credit, right? So that's where this chaos in my context, I cannot um, trust my signal that I'm getting from QV. And so there's a bit of work that has to go on that. The second thing that's uh, quote unquote chaos is when the tool, and I think we have evidence for both, the tool is too complicated, quote unquote, and demobilizes the people whose preferences we really want to measure because they're kind of routinely underrepresented, undermeasured, they don't answer surveys. We have found evidence that goes both ways. On the one hand, it does seem that it penalizes a little bit people that we would consider less um, engaged with complicated tools. On the other hand, those who do in the process start thinking about these issues more deeply. And so it seems that it also kind of shapes their preferences. They have to think it carefully, issues that they might not have thought through before. So the one-liner answer to your question is be clear what you want. In my case, it was a better signal. In the case of the senator, it's also a better signal. He wants to know what his caucus thinks. And make sure both theoretically and then empirically, and I can discuss how we do that, that you're really getting that. And so that's why we have developed an online tool that's available for everyone for free because we want people to keep using QV in different contexts and double checking that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Only when we'll have that data can we kind of, you know, have enough trust and use the tool more broadly. I, I want to keep diving into that. Um, so you raised this concern about the fact that people who... Uh, I, I don't know if it was people who have less education or exactly what demographics it was that weren't able that weren't able to participate as efficiently as others. I mean, that seems like a major problem if we're talking about this in the context of society as a whole. Um, can you talk about what struggles you dealt with on that front? So again, remember I was surveying four thousand people. So in a context like the senators, it's not a problem because everyone's engaged and the stakes are high enough that they matter. So. 
in the context of a survey, especially I think for people who are not specifically engaged with politics, they don't see, why should I answer the survey? Who cares? Nobody cares about my opinion. Versus when we've got good evidence in that in political science, people who have an education, education does not trigger that. It just happens to be people who have an education usually think politics is in their interest, that it's serving them, they're kind of more engaged, it's less disaffiliated, we call it. Um, and so in the context where the stakes are high and people think there are returns to expressing their opinion, it's not a problem. It's a problem in these large end contexts where there's a subset of the population who already doesn't see the value of the survey. So why are they gonna make the effort? Um, and so there's kind of two ways um, to think about this. And that's the problem with survey research in general. So I don't know if you follow David Shore, who's a pollster for the Dems, has showed that the real issue with our polls is that there's a certain subset of the population that's just not answering them. And they have pretty strong preferences and usually they tend to vote for populist candidates, right? So it's not specific to QV. And so that's why I wouldn't wanna say it's a problem with QV. I would just say it's a problem with survey research in general when you get to a large population. QV, if anyone who's listening wants to use this um, in kind of a smaller end setting to make important decisions, I strongly recommend it. We have found that it's much better than any alternative out there. That's perfect. Um, so, Sachin, I, I, I wonder, are there similar things happening in like the world of QF? I mean, we're, we're talking about um, hopefully a solution that can help democratize finance. But if everyday people can't access it, Maybe they're better off with index funds. What do you think about that? Yeah, like I, I don't have uh, any particular strong thoughts on this. Like where, because right now we have just implemented this uh, particular platform where we are able to exercise QF uh, to support public good funds. But uh, I certainly can see a future where uh, like not, not maybe everyone uh, become a donor, but uh, a large amount of people can influence the decisions by becoming the donors in an ecosystem and can actually, uh, uh, you know, just be a part of the decision uh, that is being taken uh, in terms of distributing funds. So yeah, I actually think here the quadratic function in this curious setting is actually drawing people in. Um, so that's why QF and QV are both similar and different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that, yeah, you, you bring up an important point, which is that part of uh, what's exciting about this is that it gives people the hope of it being a democratic process and that brings them into the room. Um, I think that the excitingness of democracy is sometimes underrated in our politics, uh, even though it can seemingly solve a lot of problems. You don't see a lot of people talking about uh, how can we make our government more democratic. You see a lot of people talking about how can we take money from rich people and give it to poor people. But you don't see so much people talking about the fundamental problem of we don't have a democratic government, so we can't do any of this stuff. Um, Charlotte, I mean, you have a lot of research specifically on that, that question of inequality and the inability of people to redistribute uh, wealth, uh, even though you would think, you know, the a priori take on this as well, if we live in a democracy, and there's more poor people than rich people, they should be able to vote and take away the rich people's money. Never happens in, in practice though. Um, what, what, what does your research find about that? Oh gosh, so buy my book, I guess. <laughs> That's a um, question, you can plug that at the end. Yeah, yeah. The, um... Because you're asking, so the one on, so quadratic voting is a tool and the democracy we have is a reflection of these tools. So the Greeks had a setup where it was, you just randomly draw, random draw who gets to decide. That creates a certain type of, of mindset. The American system is a first pa past the post system. It's a majority system that whoever gets the most votes gets to win. It's very different from other systems that such a proportional representation. And what's interesting is that turnout rates vary systematically based on these designs. And so something that some people are thinking through is that if quadratic voting, the type of, if we were to apply it to large end decision-making in democratic context, 
how would it affect turnout? Would people be more engaged? So it's a good way theoretically to think that it, it would be true. It would be closer to level of participation you see in peer system than in the current American system. So just to kind of close that, um, but tools have effects on norms, expectation, and behaviors that we don't always uh, realize. We're not, you know, if you brought quadratic voting in the US, it, it would be a different country, right? The country you see here reflects the fact that it's a very specific type of electoral rule and, and institutional uh, setup. For my research, um, so the assumption that the poor would want to tax the rich assumes that the poor assumes several things. Um, that first the poor want to tax the rich and why? Because it's in their interest. And so it assumes that people are reasoning according to their material interests. They have a set of preferences and then that these preferences get translated into policy. What I find in my research is that the way you should think about it, redistribution is as much something that you can benefit or be hurt by if you're rich through redistribution as a symbolic process. It's so symbolically what it means, symbolically it means that if you vote for redistribution, you more likely to think that the current system, capitalism, income distribution is unfair. That's why. So you vote for redistribution because you, you want to change the world towards something more fair. If you're white ring, you're like, it's not perfect, but it's not that unfair. So if you tax, you're actually making it unfair. Okay. The other symbolic politics that's playing around redistribution is who benefits from redistribution? Is it a bunch of people who are hardworking folks who really deserve to benefit from it? Or is it a bunch of free riding scroungers to simplify? And what's very interesting, these beliefs about whether or not you think capitalism is fair and income inequality is fair or unfair, and your beliefs about the number of free riders out there, these beliefs are not correlated. So some people can think capitalism is unfair, but also and want to tax the rich, but also think that redistribution benefits scroungers. So they've got this kind of complicated worldview. Some people might think that the market works. So people in Silicon Valley usually think capitalism works fine. They've worked hard. They deserve their money. But they also don't think there's a lot of free riding out there. So they end up being willing to fund some redistribution. So because redistributed preferences are much more faceted than we usually assume when we say, why are the poor taxing the rich? The world is more complicated. And so when you go to the data, yes, the poor don't always want to tax the rich. And the same way the rich are much more supportive of redistribution than you would think. Long story short. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a, a great recap. And I think that there's, there's a lot there. Uh, Sachin, so do you have any reaction to that, first of all? Yeah, it just kind of uh, is not my crown, but I'd love to know your thoughts, Sig, if you want to jump in, because you, your work on Jake Democracy Block was... Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that it's definitely the case that <laughs> preferences are complicated among people. Um, I think the hope is with um, something like... Quadratic voting, if it can be implemented on a wide scale, is that you allow those ex preferences to express themselves. Now, how does that happen? Um, you know, one thing I've thought about a little bit is the role the political parties might play, right? Um, so uh, there's this question, right, about, okay, people's preferences are very complicated. Um, they have a hard time expressing them. Um, sometimes I think that what they look to political parties for is to tell them what they believe, right? So I think political parties need to play a, a big role in whatever um, shape politics ends up taking because you can't have people spending all their time thinking about politics. We tried that over the last four years, it didn't work very well. Uh, people have to stop thinking about politics constantly and start um, thinking a little bit maybe more about identity uh, and how identity plays into you know political membership. So I think that political parties might have a role, you know, we, we, you, you mentioned about how quadratic voting has challenges in large end situations, right? Well, maybe political parties can sort of help us 
sort of combat that a little bit because they have this ability to aggregate preferences at a higher level. And then it becomes more a matter of, okay, so we have all of these people um, in the po political sphere, but not every one of their specific votes matters as much as does the aggregation that's done by the political parties at that higher level. And that can maybe help us with that large N problem. Um, but I, I don't know if that gets us all the way to the solution because it's still going to be quite a quite a large N, <laughs> which is for those who don't know po the population size of the uh, game theory problem we're solving. But that but that's where there's a bit of a tension here because you're arguing in favor of representative democracy with some kind of delegation in the meaning making to some elites versus the kind of your original question on our, oh, well, we don't live in a democracy. We actually live in a representative democracy that the, the parties kind of filter everything. And so is there a bit of a tension there in, in your two questions? There's, yeah, there's definitely uh, some amount of tension, but I think that you have to, I mean, the, the, the tension is reality, right? And that, that gets to what I was saying about like, you can't expect people to just constantly be thinking about like their political preferences especially in a situation like direct democracy, you can't have people thinking through every single vote, like uh, if, or every single ballot initiative, because direct democracy would say, there's gonna be a lot of ballot questions. Is every single person gonna think about every one of those? Well, probably not. So there has to be some amount of delegation, even in a system that is representative in nature, or that is democratic in nature. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that necessarily so solves any problems, but, um, I just think that, that that that's sort of the way it has to happen. Yeah, that's why I think the process of change should be these types of tools should start being implemented in small groups. That's my Glenn has another theory of change, but and so whatever norms develop in these decision making institutions that are small where people are engaged, I think the kind of political realm is going to come last in terms of how do we think about the rules of the game. To change the rules of the game, it's it's better to do a bit of testing in smaller settings with you know smaller budgets, <laughs> um, a few decision making, um, a few issues to decide over. Trying to 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 shift the overall democratic system, um, you know, while in, it's, it's most likely where where the the issues lie. I, I think it's I'm not sure what the model of change is there if you start there. Sachin. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely possible at scale. So just to give you an example of Gitcoin grants, like uh, it started exactly as an experiment and it was in a very small setting, right? And uh, there were a lot of projects which were invited uh, to be part of the uh, funding objects. And then now since round one until round 10, we are receiving donations from more than 10,000 people all around the globe, right? And they are collectively being the voice of the ecosystem. And it just tells how much people want this to happen, right? It's just like, it, it has a trafficta where community has a voice and then uh, the projects which want to get built are getting funded and then uh, it is inspiring a lot of people to actually, uh, you know, there are projects who want to start, but they always think, you know, where they're going to get pre-seed funding and especially a lot of developers, right? But they now have this courage to start their own projects. And just to circle back your point, Charlotte, like I think uh, QF more than, uh, QV more than QF is very possible on a larger scale and to reference what Jake has mentioned, direct democracy article, like if something like this happens where on scale, uh, people sitting in their pajamas as uh, Senator Hansen mentioned, are able to actually uh, become part of the decisions which are happening in the uh, parliament, right? It'll be just amazing. And with, with such small settings, let's say like right now, Colorado is implementing this. And if this starts getting implemented in more and more uh, such settings, and then at a larger level, like we just need more ecosystem voice to support and push this and more such senators to actually implement this. Like I'm really happy with what happened. I'm hearing this for the first time, right? 
and this is so amazing the impact it is creating and uh, i think it can go large scale and i would personally want it for my country because we want that kind of transparency and the the qr the, the data it is giving us that kind of transparency is very much required well i, I want to put you even further down that direction so um you know charlotte's saying let's experiment with this but in the crypto space in particular there's so many experiments with governance going on um some large and some small i mean have, have you seen anything um being done specifically with qf or qv that might sort of speak to that yeah yeah like uh uh not qf qf and like let's say when we talk about governance it's not really qf anywhere but uh it's soon coming you know so things are happening and uh things are gonna soon be in picture what, what does that mean like uh i cannot really uh, share much, a lot of information but you know like uh, uh the builders in the space are definitely working on a lot of exciting stuff which can soon be called a quadratic land of you know very exciting things qf and qv now you need to compare people in the crypto space to the average citizen. Maybe that answers your question on how easy it is to expand. <laughs> well, but there's also, I mean, I don't, all kinds of people are getting involved in crypto now. Um, you know, Elon Musk went on SNL and people bought their Doge coins and they were very excited about it. And I, I, I mean, I, I, Sachin, I wonder if you could speak to some of those trends as, as well, because we're seeing what seems to be an emergence of yeah, like popular culture and popular dynamics into the financial sphere that I don't think we've seen in the past. And it's, it's scary, but it's also promising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you know, uh, it's not just crypto, GameStop and how the investment world has been, you know, going crazy. I think, you know, this surprisingly, it's just a funny fact, but my mom, she's like a housewife, typical Indian housewife, and she has been investing in crypto for the last, four to five months and she has seven x her portfolio right <laughs> it's just crazy right the the kind of economics at play here is basically where people who are uh who, like it's just like everyday people who are not even uh, uh, don't even understand the concepts or actually the value of a crypto coin the, the it's it, it started as a meme dogecoin right and now it has seventy-eight billion dollars of valuation, which is just crazy. And I think uh, mass hiring and just like uh, a lot of influencers speaking the same language, and it's uh, typically mass hiring. Uh, to my understanding, is the result of Dogecoin getting so popular, and uh, a lot of uh, normies coming into crypto to start investing in such tokens but uh, yeah it's it's just a separate game right it's it's a separate game which people are having fun and they just have this mobile app and then they can just you know uh, put in money and then just can see the map going taking their assets up and it's just uh, i cannot really say about how it relates with the actual economy and the finance because it's just so tough yeah, but uh, it's definitely interesting and but uh, crypto it's not is not just this ethereum you guys know vitalik right and uh, the implications of ethereum are coming in finance as well in terms of decentralized finance and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure being built in this space and the infrastructure is basically focused to remove the middlemen like banks and actually uh, you know direct the finance like directing the democracy. So I think things are happening, uh, uh, not just the, the, like Dogecoin, but there, there are platforms where you can just invest your money and uh, uh, earn interest on it, not just uh, of 6% APY, but actually going up to till 40% or even 100%. Okay? And uh, 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 you don't have to rely on banks and you just don't have to, you know, you, you can be your own manager of assets and, and invest in different schemes.
Carly, what, what do you think of that? <laughs> Terrifying or promising? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything. I think that what fascinates me as a political scientist is that it seems to me that a lot of that world seems to be about trust. You're, you're trying to build and you're trying to trust to find a system that you could trust because it's decentralized or whatever. Um, I'm not a I'm definitely not on the technical side of this versus in political science, we study trust as something that's the property of the group. That means that because it's there, you don't need these complicated tools um, to actually, because you just trust that the institution is legitimate, that your peers are not going to try to cheat on you, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I've been just witnessing from afar, thinking, does that mean that everyone that's involved in that world really doesn't trust anything else? <laughs> that, I have more of a question. Yeah, it's, it's going into like mainstream question about what is blockchain or how, how do you even you know, trust, but the trust is actually being created by uh, the code, right? Everything uh, which is being governed, all the coordinations, all the games, all the governance is actually being governed all that trust is in the code right and uh, yeah like it's so simple right like code is defining the trust code is the rule code is the regulation and then uh, the ecosystem that is being created around that particular product is supporting the the trust that is being created by that code and but to some extent, a political scientist would say that's evidence of low trust. If you need a system that disembodied to trust it, and you're no longer giving trust to an institution because it's your, it's your nation or it's your, it's your group or it's your neighbor, the, the fact that you, you need evidence to trust it, that it's done to this kind of apolitical disembodied code-based institution, so some people might say that's evidence of low trust. Yeah, like I can I can probably say this. Like I definitely have low trust on my government on, and how things are being operated in my country particularly. And uh, I don't know about others, but the trust I've been putting on a lot of entities around me who are governing our day-to-day uh, uh, -day and uh, small life decisions are uh, just not, you know, like, I can probably go deeper into this and uh, open my rage here, but <laughs> I just really don't want to. But yeah, so like th there's definitely low trust and that's why smart contracts uh, and the idea of putting trust in code really is appealing to me and a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think that um, th this sort of gets to some of the questions I had earlier about like, uh, this tension between QF and QV, because uh, there is this sense in which the QF maximalists, I, I feel like is trying to say, hey, why don't we just, like, why do we need gov government to redistribute public goods when we can just use a QF, you know, and a little bit of philanthropy, and why do we need government anymore? Uh, and I think that's mirrored in a lot of the conversations that happen in crypto circles, where you get the feeling that sometimes there's a, a libertarian uh, agenda underneath the just underneath the surface of some of these crypto coins and you're like oh they're, they're really trying to create a coin as you say where everything is wrapped into the contracts and they don't need you know a government to enforce contract anymore because it's all coded in um is that, is that where this is going <laughs> no there are a lot of people who are in this direction one of them is me of course <laughs> because uh yeah but uh not just this, uh, QF uh, was actually, the downtown stimulus project was actually collaborated, like it was in collaboration with uh, some of the government officials, right? And uh, they, there are ways where government can uh, create transparency by using the platforms like downtown stimulus and implementing QF uh, to actually, you know, create trust uh, where there's a lot of low trust in the in the normal you know locals, so yeah. And having a bit of picture of people's preferences through quadratic voting should also help because I, I think there's a there's good research that show, for instance, that um, especially in the U.S., elected officials 
kind of overestimate how conservative their constituency is. They don't have the right picture. Why that is, because the most intense people are going to contact them, and the most intense people often happen to be more conservative. <laughs> so people care about something. And so the way democracy works right now, this is real built-in bias where the people who care really about an issue are more likely to contact the representative, and they happen to also be more ideological. And it's true on both sides, I think. And so one way to think about quadratic voting in the survey context is that you know, if, if we kind of address or solve the problem of making sure there's equal engagement, irrespective of educational background or whatever that is proxy for, uh, there's kind of a, a bigger, more rich picture of your constituency's preferences. And so we can kind of decrease the trust gap by also starting to notice the policies that people really care about, the ones they're willing to compromise on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I, I used to work in the world of uh, public housing. And we dealt with that problem all the time because it was in Massachusetts, we have very strong traditions of town hall government. Um, and what would happen is elected officials would go to these town halls and they would get chewed out if they, if they were approving, you know, a new housing project, let's say, or new zoning. I mean, that was the biggest thing was the zoning. You couldn't change zoning at all. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering, like, um, Charlotte, do you see the ability of uh, QV to... Um, yeah, strengthen institutions. You know, we had a question about this in the chat earlier. How could QV be integrated in a way that it makes our existing institutions stronger? Yeah, oh gosh, that's... Um, so at a minimum, in your case, I'm just riffing here because um, it's a larger question. <laughs> but um, so these people who might, in the QV context, who might care about not seeing a homeless shelter build next door or have a unit of like 10, you know, from a, a house to an actual building with 20 families, they might be able to use their credit to strongly signal that this specific thing they're against. That means they won't be able to use their credits on other developments, for instance, or on um, other issues that other people in the city might um, care about. So the idea here with quadratic voting, which is not perfect, by the way, but it's to say, if some people are going to build in this, are going to block the system in there because they have strong preferences on it, let's make sure it costs them something and influence on other issues. So that's the idea. They're trading influence on issues and they're saying, all right, I want my preferences to be recognized on this local issue. On others, I'm just going to kind of give up. And so Relative to the status quo, I think it's better. Is it the ideal? I don't know. Um, the ideal is to not, to be honest, to not have these small commissions that it's so costly to go and show up and during the public audit period or something that of course you get a super skewed representation of who's affected. And as a result, um, this built in, you know, deadlocks, especially with regards to zoning and housing. Yeah, it's, it's an NBism, that's killer. Um, so we're, we're getting into the last five minutes, and now I want to sort of take a look at the future. And uh, Sachin, maybe you could start us off. What what does your ideal future look like? Yeah, uh, I can maybe <laughs> uh, to to just briefly answer your question on how uh, it's strengthening institutions like QF, the QE. Uh, I think it is, and. It, 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 it can strengthen uh, institution by actually providing transparency and trust to people who are directly involved in the uh, system, right? The the whole trade, like the people who for whom the whole trade is happening, right? If they don't know what's happening, it's just like always a low trust. And this way, I think it is creating trust and transparency. Uh, yeah, of course, it may, might not be ideal, but it is definitely something much better and for me future looks like something yeah tr like truly i uh, got to know about this uh, senator hansen's uh, experiment first time i got to know a lot about uh, what uh, charlotte has worked on with qf and i read your direct democracy article i think it's just uh, the 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 kind of uh, future i see is where uh, the these decisions which are directly related to people are being exercised using QF, QV, sorry. And uh, the democratic funds, the, the way the funding is happening 
should be uh, done using the mechanism of QF. And uh, this way, we don't always have to trust uh, on code. We can also trust on the institutions who are carrying these mechanisms to ensure uh, you know, things are happening correctly and democratically. Sorry. Uh, great. Um, and Charlotte, what does your perfect future look like? Oh, gosh, I want enough economic growth that people uh, don't have to spend all their time trying to survive and bank for the future, but actually have time to think about politics <laughs> and actually engage with it in a more productive fashion. So I'm just hoping we <laughs> growth comes back uh, more seriously. I do think actually if I would have put my if I would have spent the rest of my life trying to advocate for something, it's definitely it's more on the electoral rule side. I do think the US would benefit from having more than two parties, um, at least to transition into the new type of world we're slowly moving towards. Uh, with the um, economist or political scientists call it the knowledge economy, whatever that means. And I think there's a lot of uh, important decisions gonna have to be made. And then with two parties who are so polarized and good luck in, in Congress, there's just no way these decisions are gonna be made. The problem is, they're, they're actors who are benefiting from the current system are the ones writing the rules. So electoral, electoral reform is extremely unlikely, but you have to try. I totally agree. Now I wish that we had another 30 minutes to talk about that, uh, but maybe next time. Um, so I wanna thank all of our participants for joining us. Uh, Sachin, Charlotte, thank you so much. Um, Senator Hansen, obviously not on the phone, but thank him for joining us as well. And thank all of you at home uh, for joining us on this webinar. We'll see you all next month. And until then, uh, stay radical. See y'all. <laughs>